Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. EWTN gives me this great weekly privilege to come into your homes to help you hear the stories of men and women who've been touched by the Holy Spirit, discover the beauty of the church. And this is a unique program in the sense that this hasn't, I don't know if it ever happened before on, on the Journey Home program, but this week's program is a direct connect to last week's program because our guest for tonight in many ways owes a lot of his journey to the guests that we had on last week's program. So if you didn't see uh, last week's program, you need to do it. Uh, I'm sure it's available on EWTN, uh, but we'll hear more about the influence that our guest from last week had on this week's program. And our guest this week is Chris Davis, former non-denominational Christian. Thank you, Chris, yeah. welcome to The Journey Home. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. So, Mark, last week had a bit of an uh, effect on your journey. Oh, yeah. Oh, ma major, major. The Lord used him in so many countless ways, even today. Just him and his family as a whole. Uh, now, did you know Mark Averett before you started your journey? With, well, we'll find out maybe later in your story, yeah. right? Oh, I did. I did. I actually met him in high school. Um, okay. Through his daughter. We, uh, we went to prom together. We were friends. And so. All right. We can definitely get into that. So. All right, good. Yeah, sure. Well, you know what I usually do on this program. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's let the audience know where you come from spiritually as a young man. Well, spiritually, uh, uh, my father and my mother, they broke up when I was probably two or three years old. Mm -hmm. They got divorced and my father stayed in Kentucky. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I ended up moving over to Washington State. So that's where we moved. Now, my mother being a single mother, she moved around quite a bit, you know, finding jobs. You know, she wasn't formally educated, so she had to go where she could get work. Hmm. And uh, because of that, we kind of bounced around a lot. We made a lot of different friends. Um, and that's one thing that I had to learn to do was to continually make new friends, hmm. which was probably the hardest thing to do. And so one of the ways that I did that was youth groups. There was always a youth group anywhere we go in. Um, were you, before your parents broke up, were they involved with church at all? Or? No, I, honestly, I really don't remember it enough okay. to, right. to be able to, to, to know exactly what happened. But yeah. my mom wasn't a, an extremely faithful person, but she definitely, she, she had the faith. You know, I, I think yeah. she, was, she was definitely Christian and, you know, she believed in God. But, you know, it wasn't as an important tenant of our life. So, so anyways, like I said, we uh, constantly making new friends because we had to move a lot. Uh, we were always you know, going to youth groups as one of the things that I did. And mm -hmm. I did it mostly just for socially, mm -hmm. social purposes. And we went to a number of different places, uh, mostly non-denominational churches, but also Presbyterian, even Jehovah's Witness, and even Mormon at one point in time. And mm -hmm. I, actually, my sisters were baptized Mormon as well. And, uh, and I was pretty intrigued by it as well, too, at the time, because I always wanted proof, you know. You know, I believed in God because it was socially there, culturally there, and... Uh, you know, but I wanted some proof. I wanted like hard evidence almost, you know. And the Mormons claim to have that, much like the Catholic Church does today. They claim to be the one true church and, you know, they claim to have proof as far as, you know, the, the golden book, yeah. you know. And so I remember that and I remember thinking, wow, you know, they had all these people, they have this book. I was like, that's, that's amazing, you know. So I was very intrigued by that. Never myself got baptized, but I met a lot of really good people. You know, they were really yeah. faithful people. Uh, one of the big commitments, yeah, his yeah. family and, and oh. community, and I mean, so if you're, if you're a person looking for a place because of community, yes, eh, you can get drawn there. Oh, absolutely, and that's one thing they had down packed, most yeah. definitely, and they knew scripture really well. Hmm. Um, so we met a lot of really great people. I never, again, I think at that point I just really didn't care enough. You know, it was more of a social thing for me. So, ultimately, I kind of strayed away still, and you know, through high school, I kind of again went to youth groups and things of that nature, but nothing ever really, you know, I believed in God. I kept him in the back of my mind and, you know, I would pray to him on occasion, especially when I felt I wanted something, you know, I was like, okay, God, I really like this girl, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, so only anytime I wanted anything, I never really prayed that much, but um, I would definitely say I was a Christian, but I never got baptized and uh, it and, wasn't a the high priority of your life. Yes, during that time, yes. So. And uh, so w because of the fact that we moved around a lot too, it was a very chaotic mm -hmm. lifestyle. You know, it was just always moving, making new friends. And it definitely had an impact on me growing up. And I'd say the, the biggest place that I really got 
you know, a sense of identity was, you know, the current culture. I'd, I'd say that's more mm. of what I was. I, you know, what I was taught in school, um, what I was taught by my friends. And so I really didn't even, even know a whole lot about the Catholic Church. I just kind of heard about it, you know, read about the Galileo persecution and, you know, school, yeah. of course. And uh, Your mother didn't try out the youth group for you at the no, Catholic Church? No, <laughs> no. And uh, growing up, my mom always said, you know, when you're 16, if you want to, you can go live with your father. So when I turned 16, that's what I did. I said, uh, I want to go live with my dad. And I think that took her for a surprise because I don't think she actually expected really me to say that. that. Yeah. And so, of course, she didn't want me to go, and, you know, I was her son, and, but she ultimately understood, and, you know, I think she knew I needed to know my dad, you know. Because hmm. up to that point, just what I had talked to him on the phone or, you know, come out to visit, or I went out to visit him on summer times sometimes, but uh, that was it. So, anyways, when I was 16, I left Washington State. Uh, I moved to Kentucky. Uh, when I moved to Kentucky, I just remember... It was such a culture shock, and I definitely feel it was definitely the Lord leading me. It was definitely a big step, not not faithfully at that point, but definitely ultimately led me to the church. Um, when you say a culture shock, in a better way? Oh, it was it, it was a, in a better way. I just didn't think it was in a better way at the time sure. because I remember when it happened. My, you know, again, we were very disorganized. My mom, hmm. you know, she took care of all our basic needs. You know, gave us what we needed, but. We were very disorganized. I didn't have a, learn a, as many life skills that I should have had. Mm. Um, whereas my father, he's a very, very hardworking man. You know, very, very strong. Just, you know, I would say he's a very faithful man as well too. He's a, a non-denominational Protestant as well. Mm. But uh, one of the things that struck me was just how ordered they were. I mean, it was so so far in advance that it seemed like I think at one time they had a calendar for three, 30 days in advance of what we would be eating for every meal. <laughs> and I remember going, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> this is crazy. And so for the first year, year and a half, I just really, I, honestly, I hated it. You know, I loved my family. I loved my father and my stepmother. But, uh, you know, I just, I really did not enjoy it because it was just so completely opposite of what I was used to, <laughs> you know. And also, he started introducing me to God a little bit more, and I started going to church on occasion. And you know, my father is a faithful man, but he also, you know, he's so he's, he's faithful in that he doesn't really need an answer. He's just, he has it. And for me, again, like I said, it was, I wanted proof, you know. I didn't necessarily disbelieve in God, and I definitely, you know, felt there was a God, but I still had that insecurity, and I wanted to, you know, have answers. You know, what about the dinosaurs? You know, what about, how could Adam live 900 years, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. And uh, so I remember, you know, I went to church here and there again. I started going to youth groups, and my dad took me as well. But then as I got into high school, especially towards the end, um, you know, started to be more social, you know, started getting to the social scene towards the end of high school, you know, especially in my senior year. Uh, then I joined the National Guard when I was 17. On my junior year, I went to basic training and then came back and finished my senior year of high school. And uh, after my senior year of high school, uh, well, actually during my senior year of high school, I met uh, Brittany Averett, who is Mark's, the gentleman who was on last week, uh -huh. his daughter. Uh, we went to prom together. We were just really good friends. And I came over to eat with them, play cards sometimes. And I remember one of the things that they, they just challenged me a lot. They challenged me on a lot of things. You know, I just, before I was willfully ignorant, you know, I just didn't know anything about mm -hmm. anything as far as faith. You know, I, I, I was very pro-choice. Um, I would say pro-gay marriage. I just, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything. And most of it was just out of ignorance. Hmm. So one thing, you know, me, I'm a very stubborn person at times. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, Mark can be too, you know, <laughs> as he'll tell you. But uh, one thing we did argue about was uh, pro-life. And I remember being stumped on so many occasions. I just had no, you know, well, it's the woman's body and et cetera, et cetera. And I just remember... It would frustrate me to no end because he would just stump me and I'd be like, ah, oh, wait. And then and I'd be like, okay, I don't agree with you, but, you know, I'll, I'll think of something. And uh, so secretly I got converted on that one issue for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. the Lord used that for sure. And uh, so after that, I finished my senior year of high school, uh, kind of stopped talking to the Averts for a time. And I went to job school training for the Army. 
and it took six months and it was in Fort Gordon, Georgia. And uh, it was quite an experience. It was basically Monday through Friday, eight hours a day of PowerPoint slides on computers and technology. <laughs> That's, you know, of course, what my job is. That's my trade skill is. And uh, so it's really boring. And all the guys, you know, what we do, we, we live for the weekends. And so that's when I really got into the, what I like to call my party guy phase, you know, um, you know, kind of drinking, partying, girls, of course. And, uh, and so that definitely got heavily into that. And uh, after training was completed, you know, I went home and I still took that with me, of course, and started taking classes, started going to school. And, and I just remember uh, kind of, I started feeling empty, but, you know, it was just something to do. And at first, everything was fine. I was kind of doing what the culture told me to do. You know, I was following, you know, what I saw on MTV. You know, I was kind of hanging out with my friends. And ultimately, you know, I found a, a girlfriend. We started dating. Uh, you know, of course, things got a little physical. And within a couple months, um, we had a daughter mm. on our way. You know, she became pregnant. And I remember it was such a... It was such a like scary thought because, and I didn't realize I was pro-life until it became personal. Like I just mm -hmm. I had no idea like what they had taught me before, what the Averitts had challenged me on before. You know, I was like, wow, I'm pro-life, but at the same time, I was still really scared. You know, I was really unsure. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be honest. I at, first, at times I was like, you know, abortion would be such an easy out. Sure, I mean that's that's the argument that a lot of people put to themselves. Oh yeah, that's the argument that the tempter wants us to hear. Oh yeah. Where was the girl in this thinking? I think she was kind of looking to me, you know, mm -hmm. I think she was, she was just unsure too, you know. Um, you know, I don't know that, I really don't know exactly where she looked, you know, I think she was kind of looking to me on this, so, and, and that's why I think it's so important wow. for men to really step up in, the, in that situation. They can do so much wow. and uh, so, you know, I think because I was kind of on the fence, I wasn't really sure, you know, I felt I was pro-life, so I wasn't just going to go do it at this point, but I was just like, I need to know more. Because what I was told before, it was, it's not a baby. It's a clump of cells. You know, that's all it is. You know, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing happens. You know, it's a couple hundred bucks, and it's uh, basically just a surgical procedure. Um, so I was like, I need to find out for myself. And somebody recommended, I think I actually called Mark. Many, many late night calls. Mm -hmm. I called Mark and, help me, what do I do? You know, because he, he was somebody really that just struck me. You know, their whole family as a whole. And Kathy, who is his wife, you know, they just such a loving, caring people, and the Lord really planted seeds. So, you know, at that time I called them up and really got a lot of advice. And and I believe, I don't know if it was Mark or if it was Kathy, but I believe one of them suggested I should go get a sonogram done. So we we talked about it, and, uh, you know, my daughter's mother and I, we went and we decided to go to a sonogram place. Uh, we had to go to the next town over because there was none in the town that we lived in. So... We called the lady up and I told her the situation, what was going on. I just very honest and open with her. And she's like, not a problem. She, she actually waited like an extra hour and a half because it took forever for us to be able to find the, the place. So I was just very thankful. Again, she stayed like an extra hour and a half after close. And, and I remember my ex got on the table, or excuse me, my, my daughter's mother, not my ex. I was never married, of course. Right. Um, my daughter's mother, she, she got on the table and, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the device is called, yeah. but, you know, the, she put, put that to her the wand, like yes, the wand to her tummy. And uh, we looked at the screen and there was our daughter, 10 fingers, 10 toes, just fully formed. And it was just a mountain of emotions came over me. And like, I, even now, it's just making me, you yeah. know, yeah. a little emotion thinking about it. And I remember looking at you know, her mother, my daughter's mother, and she just started crying. She just tears were rolling down her eyes. And I just, and it, after that, it, that was it. You know, there was, there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It was just, we were, that was our daughter. We were going to, you know, it wasn't even an option. And I remember she got up from the table. And she went to the bathroom to, you know, clean off the, the gel. And the woman looked to me and uh, she was just like, I was like, thank you so much. I was like, thank you so much. And she was just like, honey, no problem. As soon as I told me, as soon as you guys told me what you were thinking about doing potentially and you needed to know more, she's like, I was going to stay here till midnight if you need me to. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so it's just amazing to me like what had happened if the Averitts, you know, the Lord hadn't used the Averitts when he did, or the lady had not stayed when she did, mm-hmm. you know, what would have happened? Like, yeah. you know, and I, I'm just so very blessed. And, uh, and, uh, so at anyways, the time, yes, at, at, the, the, at time, the time, were you realizing mm-hmm. that this was the work of God in your life? I definitely felt it. I definitely felt it. And I definitely was really moved and it was an impact. I wasn't still ready though. I still yeah. wasn't ready. So unfortunately, you know, that wasn't the last conversion, you know, kind of the, the yeah. hair on the camel's back. Uh, you know, for after that, definitely, though, we got a little bit more serious. Um, I thought I was going to do the, the right thing and get a place. So I stopped taking classes. I got a job with Apple, um, started working full time. And I wanted her to be able to go to school still. So we got an apartment on campus. She continued to go take classes so she could walk to her classes. And um, we moved in together. And I got to say, we were not ready at all. Mm. Um, it's just, uh, it, again, it was the kind of culture just failing me. And I, and I will give credit to the Averitts because I called them and asked them about this. And they said, you should not move in together. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's a bad idea. You know, there, there's so many things that go along with that. And then, of course, obviously, temptation, stress, and they were like, you definitely should not do that. But I didn't listen to them, of course, you know, <laughs> and uh, so we moved in together. And, and I don't blame either one of our, either one of us. It was just two very young people, not ready for it. She was in school, very stressed. You know, she was, of course, yeah. pregnant. And, right. you know, of course, I was working full time. You know, I, I was not ready for a child. But... Uh, so the combination of those two just caused us to argue a lot, to have a lot of issues at the time, unfortunately. And ultimately, it ended up us in us, you know, going separate ways. Did, you, did your families, were they supportive of you during that time at all? Or were you pretty apart from both your families? No, uh, yeah, my father was very supportive, you know. Um, he really didn't, you know, pressure me into too much, you know. He maybe thought we should get, you know, married, you know, which definitely did come to mind, but I felt uh, I just didn't feel, you know, that was a, a sole purpose for getting married. And I, you know, I think the, I think that was a good decision yeah. now. Yeah. But uh, I mean, other than that, I mean, I really don't think there was too much pressure from our family. And, you know, her parents were really, really understanding, very understanding. Actually, it was probably one of the most frightening days of my life is when we went over there to tell her parents because oh, yeah. her father was there and we went in and to, to talk to him. And he's, he's, uh, he's, her father's Catholic actually as well too. And uh, so we went in to sit down and to tell him, and I just remember sitting way on the other end of the room. <laughs> and uh, she was with me, of course, and we told him, and he just gave me the, the, you know, kind of the serious stare. And, you know, we had a long talk, so to his, to his credit, he was very, you know, you know I, I was expecting to get strangled or something, so I was so afraid, but um, everything worked out for the best. And uh, they were also very understanding. They've been very supportive. All of our family has been. So I've been very, very mm-hmm. blessed in that aspect. Um, so anyways, as I said, that wasn't a huge game changer for me. Uh, I mean, having a daughter definitely was. You know, I had to get a little bit more serious. And, um, you know, at this, at this point, we were obviously separated. And uh, I was still kind of doing the whole party thing, you know, with mm-hmm. the, the stress of just having a child and, you know, of course, being separated now and, I kind of fell into a self-pity kind of. When she had the child, mm-hmm. did the child stay with her then? Is that she most? did? Yes, she yeah, did. Okay, all right. And I, I, I felt I always, you know, took care of the financial aspect of a child, and I, you know, I tried to see her as often as I could, and, um, you know, of course there was a little tension there, you know, can't get mm-hmm. away from that completely, but, so I fell in a time of like really a lot of self-pity and a lot of kind of depression, a lot of that, and. Uh, I, again, at this point, I, we, our apartment, our lease on our apartment ended, so I went to go live with some old roommates, and it was a very, again, just party atmosphere, bachelor, you know, kind of uh, hanging out, you know, girls, of course, and, uh, and so I just remember thinking, you know, I just got into that, and it really affected every aspect of my life, even my work, you know, I, I lost my job with Apple even, you know, which was a great company, they're such yeah. an awesome company, they really... Did a lot to help me, but um, 
so I lost so I lost that job and I was living with them and I was almost just really my life was hitting rock bottom and and uh, finally one day I was just laying in bed and I just remember just laying there being moaning kind of self-pity crying and and uh, I just remember a moment of calm came over me and then the I just God didn't come to me in like a majestic clouds in the sky and you know I am here and you know it wasn't like that it was like kind of a, just a calmness came over me at first and then the thought just came to mind mind that God is my purpose for living here I am here for God you know all of these little problems that I'm having right now are nothing I'm being pitiful you know and really my ultimate purpose is him and all these problems that I'm having now they're going to go away they're going to go away and you know I need to need to seek out God and after that just like this wave of euphoria just came over me and I just got up and I was just so excited and I remember just calling everybody I knew that was a Christian you know and uh, I just remember just wanting to know more, you know, just very hungry. And for a few days, didn't last forever, but for a few days I was very euphoric, you know. <laughs> Had another, you know, I was just very excited. So I called the Averitts and I called Mark because I knew Mark was by far the, the guy that I knew knew the most about his faith and actually truly lived it to the, to the fullest as far as, I, as far as I had ever experienced at that point. Um, so when I called him, uh, he, we just, we met up, we went to local coffee house. We, he told me a lot of things, um, answered a lot of questions. I was very curious. You know, all those answers that, you know, all those questions that I was curious about before that I never had answered, you know, I was, you know, I was really never challenged to, but I was like, now that I was actually serious about it, you know, I was challenged to answer those questions, you know, like the dinosaurs, for example, mm -hmm. and, you know, a number of other things. And, uh, and I just, uh, and I remember one day I called him and I was just, because I was thinking the day before, I was like, I really need to get out of this place. Mm -hmm. I was living with my roommate still, you know, I was like, this is a bad example, you know, bad influence on me. Um, I'm like, if I'm going to get serious about living this life, then I need to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I called him. you still in contact with your, yes. with your girlfriend and, and your Oh, daughter? yes, yes, of course. You know, um, you know, I saw her, I tried to see her at least once a week. Um, you know, have her overnight, um, you know, of course, try to help her out as much as I could. You know, I, I definitely think, you know, at that point we were, of course, there was tension there, but we were, you know, civil enough to be able to, you know, do what was right, you yeah. know. And she is an excellent mother, by the way. She has mm -hmm. just excelled above and beyond what many of us anticipated or, mm -hmm. you know, really thought because you're just not prepared for that as a young person. So she's done an excellent job. But anyway, so I, I called Mark and uh, I was, I told him my situation. I was like, I'm like, I want to live for the Lord. And, and I was like, I'm just really stressed out about, you know, I don't have a job. I don't know where to live. And uh, he's like, you can come live with us. And I was just like, really? I was like, <laughs> and I think it was that same day within hours I was over there. <laughs> I packed up my stuff and I was at the door and uh, which was a huge leap of faith for them because I mean we knew each other but you know I don't know if the Lord had just told him to reach out but it was it was so awesome and uh, so anyways it, it uh, so I came in that was that was towards the end of the summer that was 2010 I believe hmm. yeah the, the summer of 2010 that was towards the end and so I started living with them and every day was RCIA class. <laughs> Actually, he is our RCIA teacher. <laughs> so I joined RCIA that year as well, too. And I had so many questions. You know, he enlightened me what the Trinity was. I had no idea what the Trinity was. <laughs> you know, my sole purpose being here was to be uh, partakers of the divine nature. You know, that's my purpose in being yeah. here. You know, and it got me so excited. And I was on fire and, you know, I was just... I was ready to go out there and convert the world, you know, <laughs> be the be the next uh, Saint Augustine, and you know. <laughs> and so I went. Of course, I went through RCIA class, and but uh, one thing that did carry over was kind of a lot of what I had learned from, you know, the culture, what they taught a lot of young men and women my age, and so I, I struggled with a lot of you know kind of atheistic ideologies and a lot of ideas that really conflict with, you know, any, any sort of faith, you know, and 
Mark was definitely able to give me a lot of answers. You know, not everything, but he was always able to point me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because some things you just, it has to be faith. It has to be given you by God. And uh, so he was definitely a huge support. But, and at this point, I actually got a job with the prison. I was, I became a prison guard for a while. So at the, you know, I was very thankful to, and blessed to get that job as well too. But uh, again, as I was saying, the, those atheistic ideology, I was really starting to conflict with it. You know, I had one way of viewing the world that I was used to hmm. and this new way of viewing the world that I was seeing. And the two were just completely incompatible. And I just, they wouldn't mesh. And it was causing me so much internal conflict. Like I just, I couldn't handle it. And uh, I struggled with it for about a week severely. And finally I went in, I worked third shift. So I was working at night and uh, I went into work and I was working on the tower that night, which was the worst thing that could happen to me because it just left me to my thoughts. You know, there's not a whole lot going on. Just call in once an hour and say, everything's okay. Um, so I was thinking you're, you're kind of in the lookout tower. Yes, right? lookout tower right. exactly. Right. Okay. So it was a lot of thinking and uh, a lot of stress, and I just remember like on the verge of breaking, like a mental breakdown, because hmm. you can't live with two right. different ways of viewing the world, it's two different ideologies. And finally, one time I was, you know, a few hours into my shift, I was just like, I broke down, and I was like, okay, Lord, I was like, I cannot take this, I cannot make it through the shift, I am going to lose my mind. I was like, I really need you right now, Lord. I cannot do this without you. If you're there, please listen to me. I'm, I need your help. I was like, for now, so that I can get through the shift, I'm going to set it off, all this stuff off to the side. I'm going to stop thinking about it, and I'm just going to trust in you for now. And, and oddly enough, it went away. <laughs> I stopped thinking about it. But uh, what I did think about all night long after that was how much I wanted French toast. I was just imagining, like, Toast on top of toast and then syrup and whipped cream and it's all I had all night long. One of the most intense cravings I've ever had. And So anyways, I get off shift and I'm driving home with visions of French toast flying through my mind. And I was like, I'm going to make some, you know, I'm going to get home and make some. Pull into the driveway, I park the car and I go to the door and I open the door and there's Kathy standing with this giant plate of French toast. And my jaw just dropped and I was like, why did you make these? And she was just like, literally she said, an angel told me to make them for you. And I just looked up and I was like, <laughs> okay, all right, I got you. You know, and, uh, or more, he got me, you know. And uh, so we sat down, we ate French toast and I was like, what, what did you mean by an angel told you to make them? And she said, uh, I just, the Lord told me to get up and make you French toast, you know. And this is when I first started living with them, you know. She hadn't done it before, she just, the Lord told her to get up and make me French toast. So, <laughs> and after that, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say there hasn't been things I've had to work out, but, you know, the issue of faith really hasn't, I haven't really doubted that much. You know, I've, I've had moments, of course, but, you know, that, that intense, you know, just kind of went away. And, uh, of course, I've had to work out a few things here and there since then, and, you know, it's... Uh, well, why don't we pause there? Sure. That's a good place. We'll take a break and we'll come back because... I want to find out about your final steps coming into the church as well as what the Lord has done in your life since because you've, you've, you've been overseas mm -hmm. in the yeah. service of our country. So we'll talk about that when we get back from the break. Sure. Right. Welcome back. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest tonight is Chris Davis. Um, so we kind of left you in our CIA, right? Yeah. Uh, with the taste of French toast in your mouth. But, yeah. <laughs> but you had uh, you had come to see, uh, and really, this was a message to you mm -hmm. that God was very present in your life. God was listening to you in that tower. 
a tower experience, yeah. uh, a little bit different than Martin Luther's tower experience, but a, but a real tower experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were in RCI during that time that you were going through that? Yeah, I was. And again, kind of like you were saying, it was, you know, I needed proof for the longest time. But after the French toast, you know, it wasn't so much, you know, I needed proof. You know, I just kind of accepted and let God bring me the answers. And he did. He definitely did. It was just, it was, a, you know, part of a leap of faith, too. But I also realized, you know, it kind of reminds me of a quote, and I think it was Chesterton who said it, um, you know, for those who have faith, no proof is necessary. And for those who do not, no proof is sufficient. I think mm. that's what it was. And it was so very true because I needed proof before. But at that point, you know, I just, you know, I still had the questions, but I believed. And I really didn't need it anymore. And uh, so at that point, I definitely became more personal for me. And, you know, I started to, to realize it was a relationship. You know, it was that as well, too. So much more, but it was also a, a, an amazing, you know, relationship with God. And I definitely started to get into the, that, you know, get in tune with mm -hmm. my prayer life a lot better. Started praying the rosary quite often, I think almost every day. Um, uh, and uh, I definitely started to, to feel his presence more. You know, as, as one lady told me, the, the Henleys, who are another family that I know really well, they said, uh, Oh, God's giving your milk or your pablum is what it was, you know, giving me what I needed, you know, because I was a spiritual infant, so to speak. And, you know, so it, of course it didn't always last forever, but, you know, he definitely yes, set me on fire. It's, it's interesting that he chose French toast and not a steak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's how you begin your day, a little bit of French toast as opposed to the steak at the end of the, mm -hmm. at the, end of the day or, the, or a big a hot fudge sundae. You know, yes. It was, it was breakfast food. It was the beginning of the journey. So. Yes, that was definitely <laughs> the first step. And so, like, like I said, every day was uh, just RCIA. Every day was RCIA. And I started to read the Bible a lot more. I um, also started reading a lot of church documents you know, the catechism. Haven't read it all the way through yet. It's, you know, it's a good undertaking, but um, read. So there's so from many your things. background, how did you find the catechism? Did you find it uh, inspiring or difficult? Or? I, I, I was like, yes, I don't have to think about all these things. I don't have to answer all these questions. It's all here, and it all fits together, and everything the church teaches is intertwined, and it all points back to God, and everything is there's reasons for it you know there's of course there's always faith you know there's certain things you just have to take his faith you know you can't completely fully understand the trinity but uh you know i think it's it's like uh i, I listened to father john crappie once and he was saying you know if i could explain the trinity i would be god you know and, was, <laughs> and after he said that i was like oh okay well that makes sense okay sure <laughs> so it's definitely a journey. I learned so much, and uh, some things just really, really hit me, like just upside the head. And I think my favorite saint by far is Saint Augustine. I started reading Saint Augustine's Confession, and uh, he just—it was like reading my own mind almost. You know, I'm not—I'm not nearly not as brilliant right. as he is. You know, but his experience, his experiences. Yeah. You know, and you know, he struggled with some of the same things that I did. You know, and uh, you know, I love Saint Monica. You know, as well. She just kept praying and praying and praying for him. So those are two of my favorite saints as well. Well, and St. Augustine had a little boy. Oh, yes, and he did. So he experienced much of the same things that I did. Yeah. You know, so he went through a lot of the same things that I did. And um, also Humana Vitae really, really struck me, like um, especially the part where he was referring to men as a whole, you know, where he was dressing men as a whole in that, you know, how we would start regarding women, you know. And it was so true, like everything that I read in that part it was like he just read my mind in the past. Like he could just foresee what was happening. It was so, it was, it was dead on. It was dead on. And it just, you know, and just little things like that have just blown my mind. Because that was one of the, I think that was probably the hardest thing that I had a conversion went with when coming to the church was, you know, the issue of contraception. Yeah. Because to me, I just couldn't see the, you know, the moral evil in it. You know, I couldn't see how it was bad. But... And it, it's just, you know, and I remember getting arguments with Art Mark over it all the time, but finally, the, again, the Lord just slowly changed my heart on it. You know, I read the Humana Vitae. I read, uh, you know, the Theology of the Body. I read several books on that as well, too. And it just, you know, especially going through with what I did, mm -hmm. you know, living in the culture that it tells 
you know, popular culture tells young people to do, it just was such a relief. You know, I felt like, you know, what was I doing that whole time? And um, aside from that, too, uh, it just, you know, I, I felt so blessed because I was like, here I am, you know, a young man. I'm so blessed. I have been given so many gifts. And here are all my friends who are going through the same things that I am. And I see themselves falling into the same traps that I did. Mm. And like what would have happened if the Lord hadn't come when he did, you know. Mm. And really the Lord, you know, again, like I said, I read Theology of the Body. And it really made me appreciate being in the situation that I did. And reading all these amazing things on, you know, how important marriage really is. How important sacramental marriage really is. And how, you know, men and women were made for each other. You know, and it just it's enlightened my respect for it so much and uh, it's changed so much for me as well too and it's greatly blessed um, all the relationships in my life uh, mm. just coming being coming a Catholic you know me and my father actually well at first I did kind of convert my try to convert my father <laughs> you know and we got into a lot of arguments you know like on the true presence you know his body and his blood yeah. And, you know, uh, my, my father does know some scripture, so, you know, we got in quite an, me and him are a lot alike, and that's why, <laughs> you know, we're both stubborn, so we, uh, but now we've, we've actually come to, you know, it's, he's, it's just blessed our relationship, and the same with every, every relationship in my life, you know, uh, with my daughter's mother, you know, we just get along a lot better now. He's, you know, made it the next best option, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, I don't know where the Lord is going to take my life, but, you know, like I said, uh, you know, and my daughters and her mother, but, you know, we just, he has blessed it immensely. So mm. that's been a huge aspect, you know, and it's, it's taught me to so many things about myself as well, too, you know, doing daily examination of conscience, you know, going to confession, huge relief. Mm. I remember going to confession and just having that certainty that my sins were forgiven you know, it's just, it's so amazing, especially because we're so fallen. And at times, you know, I may not be truly 100%, you know, my heart's in there. But, you know, he gives us that amazing sacrament and it, it's truly amazing. And actually, uh, one of the things that I did do when I came into the church was, I was you know, like I said, I was on fire. <laughs> so I made tons and tons of promises, um, lots and lots of promises. And, uh, you know, promises that I couldn't keep. I realized I couldn't, I wasn't quite ready for <laughs> You know, I was like, I promise I'm going to pray the rosary every day. You know, I promise yeah. I'm going to do penance for an hour twice a week, you know, it, it, but in a form of exercise or something like that. And uh, I promise, you know, I'm going to, you know, just a number of things. And I just, I, I started to realize, you know, like I promised no entertainment, no TV. I'm going to be a monk pretty much. <laughs> so I was very, you know, very um, naive. Idealistic. Yeah, right. idealistic, yeah. you know. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, and it. I'm so very thankful we have the priesthood because <laughs> as I realized, I started having to go to confession because I stopped breaking all these promises, you know, I was like, you know, I made lifelong promises for these. So I was like, ah, uh, you know, I had to go to confession over and over again. And the priest one day was finally like, you know, I can, you know, release you from those promises, you know? And I was like, uh, I was like, really? He goes, it's like, you know, whatever, what's that scripture passage, you know, whatever it loose in heaven or loose on right. earth, you loose in heaven. And he's like, so, you know, a lot of the, the, the more, you know, idealistic ones that, you know, just were out of my way, I was so very relieved to, you know, I put too much of a burden on myself, basically. Right. And so that's, that's a huge blessing, you know. Um, you know, so that's, that was definitely a huge part of my coming into the faith. And yeah, sometimes we always joke we had to lock new converts, you know, mm -hmm. away in a, uh, for about a year just mm -hmm. so they can, uh, you know, get, get seasoned a bit, get beyond the French toast stage. You yeah. Know, <laughs> you know, but uh, yet we need the zeal. Yes. So that's why we don't absolutely. lock them up. We need the zeal. The church needs the zeal, mm -hmm. especially today with the call for new evangelization. We need the zeal. Right. Uh, right. So that was good. So, um, no, you ended up spending some time overseas. I did, yeah. How'd that um, happen about it? Well, Actually, I'm, well, I joined the National Guard, as you know, right. um, and I, actually we had been hearing for a long time that we were going to be getting employed mm -hmm. uh, to Iraq. And so we had been preparing and it kept getting pushed off and pushed off. And thankfully, I'm, I'm very thankful for it because everything worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. Like the Lord really strengthened me, you know, to build me up. Like he built, he kept consecutively giving me just enough of a challenge or just enough, 
you know, grace to get through what I was going through. And mm -hmm. so I really, it really led up into the, my deployment. And uh, after I got out of church, went through summertime, and then we started getting ready for deployment in, I think it was August of this past year. And I remember, um, you know, it was very hard, you know, a lot of family, he's going to miss me. Uh, you know, of course, my daughter was very small, so I worried about, you know, is she going to remember me? Um, so it was definitely, definitely my faith really, really helped me out a lot through my mm -hmm. deployment. And actually, um, before we got deployed, I uh, got some new chain of command. Uh, I had some really awesome superiors, you know, some really amazing people who really were great leaders. But uh, uh, before deployment, I also had one, one g gentleman who was above me I didn't particularly see eye to eye with. So, you know, there was some, definitely some struggle in there. And then we got overseas and, you know, of course, uh, well, my unit got deployed to Iraq for a year first. And then uh, the rest of us, we sat in Kuwait uh, for the rest of the time. And then, of course, the drawdown happened. And so we were sitting in Kuwait and, you know, we were basically just doing maintenance. I was the computer guy, so I didn't really go off base that much. And uh, it was just a very, very hot, very unpleasant. There was uh, a big tent with uh, like probably about 70 of us guys in a 50-man tent. So it was very hot, you know, and uh, very stressful environment. And, and uh, so I think one of the biggest problems was, again, I just... You know, I didn't particularly see eye to eye with, you know, some of my superiors, but of course I am, you know, the underling, so I have to, you know, follow my chain of command. And, you know, so I, it, it was definitely a test of obedience. It was majorly a test of obedience and it caused just being over there was a lot of, very stressful and, mm. you know, that added on top of it. And I was just very fortunate that our bases would just happen to be one of the bases that had a full time priest on it. So I was so blessed. and. Mm -hmm. My day that I got off just happened to be Sunday as well, too. So every Sunday, it was always just a reset day. And the Lord really just poured out so much grace on me. And it was a learning experience, too. I, bought, I brought a tote of nothing but books, you know, spiritual books. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the guys made fun of me for it. But, and I, I met some also really faithful Catholics as well, too. Um, the military can be, if, if, you're, if you don't associate with the right people, can be a very inhospitable environment for faith sometimes but you know not always and then there's all there's like I said there's a lot of very faithful people not just Catholics but a lot of very faithful mm. Protestant men and women I've had so many conversations with uh, our chaplain he was a he was a he's a Protestant pastor a Baptist pastor actually mm. and we saw eye to eye and of course sometimes we got on <laughs> debates you know I, I started trying to pull out church history a bit and uh one of, the, one of the things, of course, we always talked about was the church fathers, you know, and Augustine and the real presence and, you know, and I, I think I got him a couple times, but he was, he was pretty good. And yeah. So, but, uh, it, so that was definitely an experience, but, um, and actually it ended up because of the, the situation, it actually was, it was still very stressful. Like I said, if it wasn't for the Lord, and we actually had an adoration chapel as well, too, over there, too, a mini one. Really? Well, which was well. in, like, just a small shed, you know, yeah. and there was the tabernacle. And um, so I would go in there all the time and pray. And, uh, and there'd just be sometimes I was so stressed out. There was, I guess, you know, I don't know if that was my dark night of the soul or, you know, but it was just very, very stressful. And uh, I'd go in there and get peace. And, you know, I'd, sometimes I'd even be in tears, you know. And uh, the Lord just really gave me so much, you know, to get me through with what I did. Um, ultimately, like I said, it was still a very stressful environment, and uh, it actually caused some, you know, health problems, but mm -hmm. nothing too serious, of course. And so the, I, I got to go home a couple months early, which worked out perfectly because as soon as I got home, I came home on Christmas, or I mean uh, Easter, so uh, it, I got to go to Mass on Easter, and it was just such an amazing the anniversary service. of your coming in, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it, it worked out perfectly. And uh, so I got to go to Easter. It was a lot of, you know, it was awesome to see everybody. I got to see my daughter. And um, I came back just in time to get my current job that I have now. And it worked out so perfectly. Like if I hadn't have got those, you know, those issues, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have came back. And I work for a biomedical and IT company now. They, they hired me on right away. And it's, uh, it's just an amazing job. I love doing it. It challenges me every day. And uh, I think that's my newest challenge is to <laughs> incorporate the Lord into my everyday, into you know, your, and uh, 
the day-by-day -day work of a layman. Yes, yeah. exactly. Got an email, Jay from Indianapolis writes, I'm in college and I'm finding a lot of people don't believe in Christianity or even God. A lot of their arguments make sense and I'm starting to doubt my faith. Whenever I turn for answers, I just can't get answers that satisfy me. Do you have anything to recommend for my search? Oh, well, in my, in my faith or in my journey, it, I, like you said, I was just tremendously blessed that I had Mark Every day was RCIA, you know. Unfortunately, not everybody's going to have that. So, no, where, wherever you are, go yeah. find Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can find a spiritual advisor, that's yeah. definitely a huge thing. But I th I had the same problem. You know, I had the exact same problem, a lot of convincing arguments, and I, did, I really didn't have an answer for it. And that's why I said I needed proof, or at least I needed something to, to grasp onto my faith. And uh, so I think the biggest thing to do is, well, there's a lot of awesome resources out there as well, too. Mm -hmm. There's lots of, um, I think that's one of the ultimately the things that brought me into the church is it has the ammo to back up its claims, <laughs> you know, and it's had 2,000 of years to, to think of all these, these answers, you know, to come up with, you know, being guided by the Holy Spirit to, to give us logical, reasonable answers for, for different aspects of life and just answers the questions. So I think the biggest thing is to, Definitely start reading some books like Catholic books, apologetics. Um, definitely get a spiritual advisor. Maybe go talk to a priest. Yeah, I was going to say that's probably a good thing yeah. to find the local parish. Yes, definitely. To, to see Maybe, what they might recommend. And, yeah, yeah, go to RCIA. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've Mark has. You know, I've been in RCIA, and uh, a lot of people come just to to, to know more. You yeah. know, and so if you're just curious, that's definitely a thing to do is go to RCIA and. Like I said, I think the biggest the biggest aspect that, you know, Mark was able to answer a lot of my questions, but not only that, but he was able to give me spiritual guidance. And so he was like mm -hmm. my spiritual director. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a huge thing. If you can definitely start reading good books, um, definitely go talk to a priest. See if you can get into an RCIA program and just reach out to people. You know, if you maybe start going to Mass again and mm -hmm. just see who fits that bill, you know, and go talk to them. So. All right. Another email, Martha from New Mexico writes, My granddaughter had a difficult life growing up and she has started living a rebellious, immoral lifestyle. What can I do or say to her to show her that she will never be happy without God in her life? Um, I think that's something I've kind of experienced with too because I've had friends and family that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, have gone down that path a little bit, you know, especially a lot of my friends and, you know, especially when I was first coming into the faith. You know, I tried converting them. You know, I didn't let the Lord lead. You know, I kind of forced it on them. And so I think the best thing you can do is be there for them to be a good example, to pray, pray and pray and pray. And I think that was probably one of the biggest things. I had the, the Averitts and a few other families praying for me that whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was going through college and, um, you know, military, just lots of prayer. And, uh, I think, again, that reminds me of St. Monica. You know, she prayed for her son for 20 years. Yeah. And uh, I think she, at one point, got down and was talking to her local bishop, and she was basically annoying him. And he said, you know, woman, any, you know, any woman who prays for her son this much, you know, there's no way he could, you know, not come back to the church. I don't remember the exact words, but... So I think it's the exact same thing. You just got to pray. Got lots of prayer. Um, you know, when pray for them, the Lord to open the door. And that's happened to me and my own family. I've just, you know, instead of forcing it on my family, I've, you know, learned to just pray and wait for the opportune moment. And the Lord will let you know for sure. You and my son, John Mark, were talking about this transition of understanding faith. Mm -hmm. And you'd gone through that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to put your finger on when that transition happens. But, but can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think sometimes it really is a work of God. Yeah, it's not something you can make happen. But but right. how do you how do you spark it? How do you you make that move? Right. Um, it's prayer. I mean, again, I think that that was the biggest thing for me is to keep in mind one. It's hard to pray. You know, I think it's just like every aspect of life, the the mental and the physical. You know, mentally you have to. You know, it might not be easy. You know, to to read books and to learn and do math and all those other you know intellectual things, but you know, you just have to exercise it. The same way with your body, you have to exercise it. It'll be difficult at first, but eventually it picks it up. And I think it's the same way with the spiritual life. You, you know, you just have to, to exercise that. And I think that was the thing for me is just to, 
you know, realized is when I was having a moment of doubt or, you know, I was challenged on something I didn't know, um, I, I would say, you know what, right now I'm not going to let it stress me out. I don't know the answer. But Lord, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe in you. I'm going to, I just ask that you please show me this. You know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I don't know right now, but Lord, I just I trust you to guide me and to, you know, just take that leap of faith to say, you know, I'm going to believe in you regardless. Kind of like that night in the tower that I had, you know, just to set it aside, you know. Yeah. If we look at the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. Jesus says to ask mm -hmm. and you'll receive. Exactly. Seek, you'll find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Right. He doesn't give the length of time that's going to take between the asking and the receiving and yeah. seeking and find and knock. You know, that might take a long time. Oh, yeah. But it involves his invitation to us mm -hmm. to make that move, to ask, to seek, to find. And he says you'll comfort. Mm -hmm. That's his promise. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't say when. Right. So it's, it's that constant asking and seeking, and that's what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. You, you nailed it right on the head. You put it in yeah. perfect terms. It's just you have to ask. You have to let the Lord lead, and you just have to, you know, sometimes you have to take a leap of, leap of faith because there's some really difficult questions out there, hmm. you know, and, you know, I think the church has an answer for most everything, though. Yeah. <laughs> if you look, you just got to yeah. look, you know, and, uh, of course, like I said, pray and ask the Lord to show you. An uh, email from Brian from Stamford. Ever since my conversion to Catholicism, I seem to be struggling in my work and personal life. Hmm. Living a moral Catholic life in the world is hard, and sometimes I feel like giving up since so many things have gone wrong since I became Catholic. Could Chris give me any advice? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely right there with him on that. Uh, I've, I'm just now getting to the point where, you know, that's really, I'm starting to pick that up. Um, and I think one thing that really helped me was I bought a devotional. Um, it had a morning, it's very structured, it's almost, you know, kind of liturgical, if you, if yeah. you will. Um, and it has kind of a, a morning prayer with a psalm and then a morning, or then a night prayer with a psalm as well. And um, then it has the canticle of Mary and uh, Zachariah too. And yeah, Zachariah's so, in the morning and then yes, and Mary's at night. Exactly. Right? And so I've been reading that. And so I bought a good devotional. It has, and then of course I read the Mass readings in the afternoon during my lunch if I can. Um, so I'll read that and then I'll pray on that, do some Lectio Divina, um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> and. Uh, so that was definitely a huge thing for me, and I think it, it can be it can get so distracting, especially in a busy job, which I definitely have. That sometimes you just have to force yourself to just take a moment, you know. And especially in the mornings, you know, sometimes you're just tired, you don't you're grumpy, you don't want to do anything, and it just it's you, it's kind of you have to get into a little bit of a routine, but yeah. you know, also. Just, and and again, I would also encourage the them to to remember they're not to be doing this alone. That yes, you can find the support. Like you have the Averys, mm -hmm. but some people, the, the beauty of a, of a group like Opus Dei mm -hmm. or being a third order Franciscan or a third order Dominican, especially if you're single, uh, or finding, hey, if you can't find it in your local parish, right. start it. But for people your own age to have the support who struggle with living your faith in the real world. And I, I think going on top of what you said is, uh, you know, it's, it's in addition to changing myself, I really had to choose new friends, you know, unfortunately, I still, I'm still friends with all my old friends, you know, I still keep in touch with them, I haven't, I'm, I'm not better than them, I haven't cut myself off from them in a sense, but, you know, so you become kind of your, part of your environment as well too, so that was a huge change for me is, when I was coming into the church, I just couldn't do yeah. some of the things that they wanted to do anymore, and even for a time, I was almost kind of lonely, just because I had the Averitts, of course, but, uh, you know, there's not as many young people, and you know, living a faithful life, you know, at times, of course, there are a lot of really young, you know, faithful people. And right. so it just required me to, you know, make new friends and to have a good support group, like you said, and, you know, definitely make friends and do things with people that share the same values that you do and the same, share, especially the same faith. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what the New Testament writers encouraged us to do, not to mm -hmm. necessarily abandon those outside the church, but mm -hmm. recognize we need the strength of the church so that we can be strengthened to help those outside the church. Absolutely. You, know, you, you can't do it on your own. Chris, thanks for joining us oh, on yeah, the Journey definitely. Home and sharing your journey and our prayers are with you and your daughter and, uh, and your continued work and service to our Lord. Oh, thank you. Thank and you, Chris. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home. I hope Chris is 
uh, own struggles and journeys in his discovery of his relationship with our Lord remind you of how much the Lord loves you. So God bless you. See you next week.